Like the worst days of the cotton mills of 19th century Britain, the evil spectre of child labour was just as prevalent in North America. Children of five or six years of age worked in the mills of the South, often working all night and maddened by the racket of machinery in a humid, fetid atmosphere. Back-breaking twelve-hour shifts were common for children, employed as cheap labour, at a time when men were expected to work just eight. A child worked in a living hell, receiving nothing but the prospect of injury, in return for a wage barely enough to pay for food. The cruelty of child labour was just as common to northern states as it was to the south, save for the industry that was their torture. In the mining districts of Pennsylvania, children laboured under conditions which were, if possible, even more injurious to them than the child labour of the cotton mills. Robert Hunter, a sociologist who served on New York's commission investigating child labour in the early 1900s, said, In the mines, mills and factories, before the furnaces, and in the sweatshops of Pennsylvania, that state of colossal industrial crimes, 120,000 little ones were, in the year 1900, sacrificing a part of their right to life, most of their right to liberty, and all of their right to happiness. The girls went to the mills, the boys to the breakers. From the 1860s to the 1920s, when mechanical separators became widespread, breaker boys worked to separate impurities from coal by hand. Coal is often mixed with impurities such as rock, slate, sulphur, ash, clay or soil. Breakers were tasked at removing impurities, breaking coal and sorting the pieces into categories of nearly uniform size. This job was labour-intensive and mostly given to children, though elderly coal miners who could no longer work due to age, disease or accident were sometimes employed, perhaps hunched over from having worked the same job as a boy. An 1885 law required boys to be at least 12 years of age to work as coal breakers, raised to 14 years in 1902, and at least 14 to work in the mines. There was, however, chronic exploitation of children for labour, as the law was both inadequate and poorly enforced, if indeed not altogether ignored. Some states didn't even have compulsory registration of birth, and boys were passed off as small for their age. At the 1902 Anthracite Coal Strike Commission held in Scranton, Pennsylvania, breaker boys and miners explained the working conditions they endured in the collieries, a breaker boy who was called to give evidence stated that he normally received 65 cents a day, but received just 25 cents the month previously. The Delaware and Hudson Company, which employed him, keeping the rest of the money for rent. He said he knew of one boy who received only one cent a month. When he applied for work he had misrepresented his age. His mother gave the company his correct age but the boy was still employed by the company. Working conditions were harsh and safety was poor. Boys were put to work as soon as they could be trusted not to fall into the machinery and be killed. There was hardly an employment more demoralising and physically hazardous than work in the breakers. For 10 or 11 hours a day, children of 10 and 11 years of age stooped over a chute and picked out slate and other impurities from coal as it tumbled down and passed them on a conveyor belt. They were often forced to work without gloves so that they could better handle the slick coal, and, because slate was sharp, boys could often leave work with fingers cut and bleeding. The roar of the crushers, screens and rushing mill race of coal was deafening. Working amongst fast-moving machinery, a lack of attention could mean fingers, arms or legs might be trapped and amputated and, at worst, boys might be mangled, crushed to death by conveyor belts and gears, or smothered by coal. A 15-year-old boy, who appeared as a witness at the aforementioned Coal Strike Commission, stated that he had lost a leg when working as a breaker for the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, but received nothing for the loss of his limb. The air was dense with black coal dust that boys breathed day after day, choking their lungs, which became black with anthracite. Many contracted what was called at the time coal miners' asthma, 
but the effects of coal dust inhalation on the lungs were little understood at the time. Industrial bronchitis developed from exposure and inflammation. Long-term coal dust inhalation caused severe lung damage and breathing difficulties known as black lung disease. In the following account by John Spargo, you will discover how boys worked as breakers in the most horrific of conditions. Spargo was a political activist who travelled America at the turn of the 20th century, concerned with social inequalities and the evils of child labour. He visited a breaker so as to understand this appalling work for himself, discover the gloomy atmosphere in which he found himself amongst the terrible noise of the machinery, and how, within minutes of working as a breaker, he was cut, bruised, and after just half an hour was coughing and spitting from the coal dust he was forced to breathe. He soon came to realise that he could tolerate it no more. And yet, this was the only life some boys knew. Dangerous work, day after day, in return for less than a dollar a day. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. According to the census of 1900, there were 25,000 boys under 16 years of age employed in and around the mines and quarries of the United States. In the state of Pennsylvania alone, the state which enslaves more children than any other, there are thousands of little breaker boys employed, many of them not more than nine or ten years old. The law forbids the employment of children under fourteen, and the records of the mines generally show that the law is obeyed. Yet in May 1905, an investigation by the National Child Labour Committee showed that in one small borough of 7,000 population, among the boys employed in breakers, 35 were 9 years old, 40 were 10, 45 were 11, and 45 were 12. Over 150 boys illegally employed in one section of boy labour in one small town. During the anthracite coal strike of 1902, I attended the Labour Day demonstration at Pittston and witnessed the parade of another at Wilkes Bear. In each case, there were hundreds of boys marching, all of them wearing their working buttons, testifying to the fact that they were bona fide workers. Scores of them were less than ten years of age. Others were eleven or twelve. Work in the coal breakers is exceedingly hard and dangerous. Crouched over the chutes, boys sit hour after hour, picking out the pieces of slate and other refuse from the coal as it rushes past to the washers. From the cramped position they have to assume, most of them become more or less deformed and bent-backed like old men. When a boy has been working for some time and begins to get round-shouldered, his fellows say that he's got his boy to carry round wherever he goes. The coal is hard, and accidents to the hands, such as cut, broken, or crushed fingers, are common among the boys. Sometimes there is a worse accident. A terrified shriek is heard, and a boy is mangled and torn in the machinery, or disappears in the chute to be picked out later, smothered and dead. Clouds of dust fill the breakers and are inhaled by the boys, laying the foundations for asthma and miners' consumption a general term used at the time for shortness of breath, cough and tuberculosis caused by coal dust inhalation. I once stood in a breaker for half an hour and tried to do the work a twelve-year-old boy was doing day after day, for ten hours at a stretch, for sixty cents a day. The gloom of the breaker appalled me. Outside the sun shone brightly, the air was pellucid, and the birds sang in chorus with the trees and the rivers. Within the breaker there was blackness. Clouds of deadly dust enfolded everything. The harsh, grinding roar of the machinery and the ceaseless rushing of coal through the chutes filled the ears. I tried to pick out the pieces of slate from the hurrying stream of coal, often missing them. My hands were bruised and cut in a few minutes. I was covered from head to foot with coal dust, and for many hours afterwards I was expectorating some of the small particles of anthracite I had swallowed. I could not do that work and live. 
but there were boys of 10 and 12 years of age doing it for 50 and 60 cents a day. Some of them had never been inside of a school. Few of them could read a child's primer, a basic textbook for teaching reading. True, some of them attended the night schools, but after working 10 hours in the breaker, the educational results from attending school were practically nil. We goes for a good time and we keeps the guys what's there hopping all the time, said little Owen Jones, whose work I had been trying to do. How strange that barbaric patois sounded to me as I remember the rich, musical language I had so often heard other little Owen Joneses speak in faraway Wales. As I stood in that breaker I thought of the reply of the small boy to Robert Owen. Visiting an English coal mine one day, Owen asked a twelve-year-old lad if he knew God. The boy stared vacantly at his questioner. God? he said. God? No, I don't. He must work in some other mine. It was hard to realise amid the danger and din and blackness of that Pennsylvania breaker that such a thing as belief in a great all-good God existed. From the breakers, the boys graduate to the mine depths, where they become door tenders, switch boys, or mule drivers. Here, far below the surface, work is still more dangerous. At fourteen or fifteen, the boys assume the same risks as the men, and are surrounded by the same perils. Nor is it in Pennsylvania only that these conditions exist. In the bituminous mines of West Virginia, boys of nine or ten are frequently employed. I met one little fellow ten years old in Mount Carbon, West Virginia, last year, who was employed as a trap boy. Think of what it means to be a trap boy at ten years of age. It means to sit alone in a dark mine passage, hour after hour, with no human soul near, to see no living creature except the mules as they pass with their loads, or a rat or two seeking to share one's meal, to stand in water or mud that covers the ankles, chilled to the marrow by the cold draughts that rush in when you open the trap door for the mules to pass through, to work for fourteen hours, waiting, opening and shutting a door, then waiting again for sixty cents, to reach the surface when all is wrapped in the mantle of night, and to fall to the earth exhausted and have to be carried away to the nearest shack to be revived before it is possible to walk to the farther shack called home. Boys twelve years of age may be legally employed in the mines of West Virginia, by day or by night and for as many hours as the employers care to make them toil, or their bodies will stand the strain, where the disregard of child life is such that this may be done openly and with legal sanction. It is easy to believe what miners have again and again told me, that there are hundreds of little boys of nine and ten years of age employed in the coal mines of this state.